This is a CBS News special report. The flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. At this moment, one of the most dramatic moments in the flight of Apollo 10 since its launch from Cape Kennedy on a Sunday afternoon. At this hour, the crew of Apollo 10 is about 724 miles from the moon, statute miles, as the crow flies, except that no crow has been reported flying there, 247,000 miles from Earth. It's plunging toward the moon at some 5,000 miles an hour, almost 5,700 miles an hour it'll be very shortly. To put it another way, Apollo 10's about as close to the moon now as New York City is to Indianapolis, a trip that uh, a lot of us have made. It's uh, as far from the Earth as the equivalent of 25 round trips from New York to Sydney, Australia, which few of us have attempted. A couple of hours ago, we had a last look at the crew before it headed for the dark side of the moon, the side away from Earth, outside of television and radio range. Uh, we hope to have that uh, look at the uh, astronauts as they reported to us uh, a little after one o'clock our time, three hours ago. Right now, they're on the way to the moon, as we say, and for lunar orbital insertion, which will come on the dark side of the moon. Let's listen to the conversation as they approach the moon, as relayed to us from Mission Control in Houston. They're coming up uh, sporadically here as they report their last uh, maneuvers in getting into a position which is uh, with the back of the spacecraft facing toward the moon or their orbital path. They're pitched about 22 degrees. Uh, that is uh, just a little bit off of the vertical. At in about five more minutes, 4.37 uh, this afternoon, signal will be lost with the spacecraft as they disappear behind the dark side of the moon. And then just nine minutes later from that, they will fire their uh, service propulsion system engine, 20,500 pounds of thrust, for almost six minutes to put themselves into orbit around the moon. That is a braking maneuver. They slow down from 5,700 miles an hour, which will be their speed at that point. And in order to prevent being slung by the uh, moon's gravitational pull back into a course toward the Earth, they will uh, slow down to 3,700 miles an hour, which is the orbital speed around the moon. They'll go into then a high elliptical orbit around the moon with the low point at 69 uh, miles above the moon's surface, the high point 195 miles above the moon's surface. They'll come back from that dark side of the moon and for the first time report to us how that uh, very important burn of the service propulsion system engine went at 70, at uh, 512 p.m. That's going to be quite a long wait for the men in Mission Control in Houston and all of us around the world as we wait almost breathlessly to hear how they have done uh, in that uh, important maneuver. They're, they disappear at 4.37. Uh, according to the present calculations, they reappear at 5.12 as far as the communications go. The burn should come at, uh, as we said, uh, 4.45 or nine minutes after the disappearance of behind the moon's surface. If by any chance they find that they cannot fire the service propulsion system engine, or for any reason decide not to fire the service propulsion, propulsion system engine, uh, they will come back around the moon just a little bit earlier because they'll be making 5,700 miles an hour instead of going through that braking maneuver, of course. And then we would hear from them at one minute after five. Here's a transmission from them. propulsion system engine. We should have about and two and a half more minutes of... Mark two seconds early to allow for the lag time in communications. 
That's the voice of Jack Riley in Mission Control in Houston. The voice in Mission Control, who is the capsule communicator talking to the space craft, is Charles Duke. Uh, two minutes to LOS. Uh, everybody here says, got the... Okay, and we'll see you right on the other side in orbit. All right, there's 76-22-55. LOS is loss of signal. We'll be going. The command module with the lunar module attached to its nose, as it has been since uh, they linked up on Sunday afternoon, shortly after liftoff from Merritt Island, the Kennedy Space Center, goes into an orbit, or go passes the moon to the left side as we look at the moon, and is grabbed by the moon's gravitational pull around, pulled around to the far side. At that point, the spacecraft engines are fired to slow it down, a braking action which slows it down by 2,000 miles an hour, from 5,700 miles an hour to 3,720 miles an hour to put it into lunar orbit. You perhaps have heard the last from the spacecraft heard uh, Houston wish them Godspeed, and Stafford say, we'll see you on the other side, which may turn to, out to be the phrase from all of these moon-orbiting spacecraft, since that was the last word we heard from Frank Borman when Apollo 8 went around the moon in December. The time has come for officially the loss of signal. And presumably we have now heard the last of the spacecraft until sometime after 5 o'clock, uh, at least 30 minutes from now. Before this flight began, David Schumacher spoke with Command Module Pilot John Young about the reliability of Apollo 10's giant engine. Well, I think uh, the service propulsion system has certainly shown that it's a very reliable system design-wise. I don't... I don't, I don't think that it has any design problems. Uh, one thing about Apollo 10 that we didn't have in Apollo 8 is if, if, if we can't do lunar orbit insertion, uh, you know, if for some reason the engine doesn't light and we coast out of lunar orbit, or if it lights and only burns for a little while, we have, and then shuts off for some reason, we can still get out of lunar orbit with a descent propulsion system on the lunar module. So we're a whole spacecraft up on the Apollo 8 guys. And uh, again, if uh, for some reason before we uh, start a rendezvous and stage the descent engine on the lunar module, uh, the service propulsion system were to quit, we can redock, leave the descent engine on the limb, and use the descent engine to get us back. So we're a couple of engines ahead for a long period of time. So, the Apollo 10 is now going to the other side of the moon. It is between, the, or the moon is between the Apollo 10 and Earth at this point, so we can't hear anything from it. Those three great tracking stations with their 85-foot dishes are hearing nothing from space at the moment. Uh, we wait now for word from Apollo 10 when it comes back from the other side of the moon. It's going to be a long 30 minutes until we get word that they have successfully fired that service propulsion system engine about which you just heard John Young talking to David Schumacher. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Hi, Mom. Did you remember to feed my turtle? When you talk to someone far away, you need help. You get a Western Electric. We're the people who make phones, wire that carries your voice to your Bell telephone cut. Switching equipment that selects a phone for your voice. Amplifiers that keep your voice strong and clear. And equipment that puts it on a coaxial cable. In fact, all along the way, your voice speeds over a lot of things Western Electric makes. Yes, Tommy, I fed you turtle. 
Yes, dear, I'm taking very good care of him. Western Electric is in the bell system to help make sure your voice has a smooth ride every time. This decision to fire the service propulsion system engine there on the far side of the moon is a critical one for the astronauts aboard Apollo 10. For once they have committed themselves to moon orbit, uh, then they, of course, have to get out of moon orbit if they're ever to come home again. They will have two possibilities of doing that in contrast to Apollo 8. The principal means and the intended means will be to fire for a second time the service propulsion system engine after they have jettisoned the lunar module. That will be after the lunar module has made its trip down to the moon's surface tomorrow afternoon and then has rejoined the command module circling overhead. However, if before they cut loose the lunar module and it makes that trip, they decide that there is trouble with the service propulsion system engine, they could use the descent stage of the lunar module itself to put them into the trans-Earth trajectory, that is to send them back toward Earth instead of forever circling the moon. But once they have gotten rid of the lunar module, then that service propulsion system engine will have to work on Saturday afternoon in order to, for them to get out of the lunar orbit and back on the way toward uh, the good Earth. The flight has been absolutely perfect as far as the systems aboard the spacecraft go uh, so far. Their health is said to be excellent, according to uh, Dr. Charles Berry, the astronaut's physician, who says that they're in the best shape of any of, any of the Apollo crews so far. They have had a little bit of uh, stomach distress, uh, gas, as a matter of fact, brought about by the hydrogen bubbles in the water supply. A piece of equipment they devised to get those hydrogen bubbles out of the water supplied as a byproduct of the fuel cells on the uh, spacecraft did not work. That was whirling the bag around, and if you were watching television yesterday afternoon, you saw that demonstration, whirling the bag around and trying to get the bubbles to come to the surface. Well, for some reason or other out there in the weightlessness of space, the bubbles didn't come to the surface. Instead, they all joined together in one great big bubble, and they're still ingesting a great deal of hydrogen, and it isn't any too comfortable for them. But they said they felt great when they got up this morning to the tunes of uh, uh, music being played from Earth uh, here, uh, music the number being, on a clear day, you can see forever. And since then, they have been getting ready for these critical moments of putting their Apollo 10 into orbit around the moon. Bill Stout and Leo Krupp at North American Rockwell in Downey, California, can tell us what's going on there in the command ship right now as they pass through and into the dark side of the moon. This outside view of our uh, CBS News North American Rockwell mock-up, Walter, gives you uh, some idea of how the big rocket is used for uh, breaking the spaceship. In effect, it's been flying in uh, rear end first. Is that right, Leo, and they fire this engine to slow it down and toss it into the proper orbit? Uh, that's right, Bill. The lunar orbit insertion burn has to be a retro maneuver to slow down the, the vehicle's relative velocity to the moon. Because right now our velocity is so great that if we did not slow down, we would hook around the moon into a large elliptical orbit which would bring us out on the other side far enough to put us back into the sphere of influence of the Earth's gravitational field, and we'd come back to Earth on a free return. So if the decision is made to retro into lunar orbit, they will fire the service propulsion system for a, quite a long burn, about six minutes, which will slow the velocity down sufficiently to allow the moon to capture the vehicle into a 60 by 170 nautical mile elliptical orbit. And then they fire again to tighten that, is that correct? That's right. We'll stay in two uh, lunar parking orbits uh, while they final line the trajectory. Then there will be another short service propulsion system burn, which will further adjust the speed to put us into a 60 nautical mile circular orbit. Mm -hmm. And then they must count on this engine again, as I think Walter mentioned a moment ago, uh, to get them out of orbit and start them back to Earth. Isn't that correct? Uh, normally, we'll use the service propulsion system to come back uh, on our trans-Earth insertion to come home. However, as Walter pointed out, on this particular flight, we do have the capability of using the lunar module descent propulsion engine to get out of uh, lunar orbit if there should emergency should arise or a malfunction in the service propulsion system. So everything seems to be ready, Walter, for what you so aptly describe as a very critical point in this mission, leading up to man's closest look yet at the surface of the moon. And that moment will be coming any second now as they fire the service propulsion system engine for the first time, if that is their determination, if they make no change in their plan. And this simulation shows that engine burning. 
It should be taking place right at this moment. It burns for five minutes and 54 seconds, almost six minutes. Slows down the spacecraft by nearly 2,000 miles an hour, from 5,700 miles an hour to 3,720 miles an hour. And as Leo just pointed out, and we have before, uh, that is uh, the orbital speed that suspends it between the moon's gravitational pull and the momentum which would uh, throw it on out into space again with its speed. We won't be hearing that this uh, burn has come successfully until 12 minutes after 5, another 27 minutes from now, and that's going to be quite a long time to wait to hear that it is successful. If, however, the burn was not made at all and it held on to its 5,700 mile an hour speed, it'll be coming out from behind the moon about uh, 10 minutes before that, about 11 minutes before that, so that 5.01 uh, we would be hearing from it. Of course, Houston is hoping that it doesn't get that signal at 5.01, indicating that the burn did not go as planned. If the uh, service propulsion system uh, burned only partially, uh, part of the burn, they could still uh, make their corrections. They would go into an orbit around the moon, uh, which would be an uh, high elliptical orbit uh, of some distance, depending upon the amount of the braking burn by the service propulsion system engine. And then they, if they could refire the service propulsion system engine on a future orbit, they might still go into uh, orbit around the moon, but they probably would use it instead as a posigrade burn, that is a forward accelerating burn to get back up to their 5,700 mile an hour speed and come out from behind the moon to come back to Earth. That will be on a subsequent orbit. That is the alternate plan if, uh, the, if the engine only functions for part of its scheduled six minutes. We've been talking about the command modules service propulsion system engine, this 20,500 pound thrust engine you see here now burning in the simulation. Uh, we also have talked about the lunar modules engines and the fact that the descent stage of that engine uh, could, if needed, put the uh, spacecraft back into its uh, trajectory toward Earth. Nelson Benton and Scott McCloud at Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island might be able to tell us more about those lunar module engines. Gentlemen? Well, we thought, we thought we'd give you a, a walk around of the engines. Actually, the lunar module has 18 engines all together on it, uh, many of them very similar to those on the command module. And right out, out the window here is some of the 18, the uh, RCS, the reaction control system. Scott, uh, we're going to be hearing terms, terms like dips and apps and that sort of thing. Tell us about those other big engines. Well, the RCS that you mentioned, there are four on each corner. They're called quads. <clears throat> On the descent stage, that large engine you see sticking out below, that's the descent propulsion system. That's the dips. It's about to roughly 10,000 pounds of thrust. On the ascent stage, you have the ascent engine, the ascent propulsion system. That's the apps that you're referring to. And the, the dips, uh, we're told, we can use that to help uh, bring the docked spacecraft uh, back to the moon if necessary. Well, yes, if there back should from be... Back the moon if necessary. <laughs> if there should be a problem uh, with the propulsion system on the service propulsion module, then you can use the descent engine from the LEM, even though it's only approximately half the thrust, it just means you would have to fire it twice as long. And in effect, all these engines we're talking about... Uh, really don't have what you would call moving parts. No, no, they don't. They have uh, fuel and oxidizer, and when they mix together, they immediately ignite. This is the hypergolics that we were referring to before. And hopefully the reliability is about the same as dropping a match in a gas tank. Yes. Walter, back to you. That's pretty reliable. If it goes, uh, goes that well, but not that explosively, I hope uh, all will go well with the flight as it has so far. Today's uh, big events uh, in the uh, progress of Apollo 10 toward the moon, where the, in the first place it's coming into the moon's gravitational pull. That came around 2.45 this morning when the moon's gravitational pull took over from the Earth's gravitational pull. Up to that time, the 
uh, spacecraft, just like a car going uphill, have been slowing down all the time from the time that it fired its third stage of the Saturn engine uh, on the second orbit around the Earth Sunday afternoon. It had gotten down to a speed of just a little over 2,000 miles an hour when, while the astronauts were sleeping very soundly today, and they slept almost 11 hours, uh, they, uh, they came under the gravitational pull of the moon itself. Since then, they have been speeding up, and they were getting up to 5,700 miles an hour as they swept behind the uh, moon just a few minutes ago. The, uh, at uh, 1.40 this afternoon, they went into darkness, or semi-darkness, by passing into the shadow of the moon, uh, uh, the moon coming between them and the sun at that point. That shadow lasted for about two hours, and they came out of the shadow again uh, around uh, 3.40 this afternoon. And then the big moments which have, are taking place right now. The service propulsion system engine burning, it's got about another minute to burn uh, until it shuts off, if all is going well. There it is. The shutoff is shown in our simulation here. If uh, things have gone as we show it here, the engine now is down. A few conversations going, but not very many. Most controllers sitting at their consoles very quietly. Jack Riley reporting from Houston that uh, all is quiet in mission control in Houston as they wait anxiously for the word from the moon word that uh, should come in about uh, 19 minutes from now, if all has gone well. Our simulation shows the spacecraft over the far side of the moon, which has, is now being seen by the fourth, fifth, and sixth human beings ever to make this journey. The first three were, of course, on Apollo 8 in December, the first men ever to peer down on that far side of the moon. The far side of the moon has been photographed, of course, by uh, Soviet and American lunar orbiters, but the Frank Borman crew of Apollo 8 were the first men to actually look at it. And now here are Tom Stafford, John Young, and Eugene Cernan having that look as well. We hope it's a peaceful look for them, that all is going well with them. Bruce Morton, down at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, I've been talking about Apollo 8. How, how does this lunar operation differ from the one we saw on Apollo 8? Well, I think the main difference uh, is this question of safety that we've all been talking about, and uh, that centers around the fact that, as we heard John Young say a while back, uh, Apollo 8 didn't have a lamb, didn't have a lunar module, so that uh, when they were going through all these maneuvers, their service propulsion system, that big 20,000 pounds of thrust rocket that we've been seeing, just absolutely had to work. If it had failed completely, they still had the one safety factor, of course, of being on a trajectory that would bring them back to Earth. But if it had started and then stopped too quickly, they could really have been stuck. And that's just not true this time. Uh, we've been talking, you have, Nelson Benton has, Bill Stout has, about all of the different combinations that can be worked here. And there really is no, uh, no point here at which the failure of one engine can prejudice this flight. Uh, if the service propulsion system engine doesn't work, you can use uh, the descent engine on the lunar module, and that will get you back in an Earth trajectory, or that will get you back in a lunar orbit. Uh, even after the lens separates, there are a lot of possibilities for playing one engine off against the other. The, uh, Command and service module can go down and get the lamb if the lamb has trouble getting back. And there's, re there's really no point at which you can look at one of these engines and say, that's it. Uh, that, of course, won't be true next time with Apollo 11. Uh, once you're down on the surface of the moon, the ascent engine really does have to lift you off. But this time, there, there are a lot of built-in safety factors that, uh, despite the, the confidence that everybody here had in 8 when it went, uh, just weren't present uh, that time around. Walter? Uh, Bruce, there, there, is that, uh, there is that one point where uh, there's only one engine, no redundancy, and that's in that final burn of the service propulsion system engine to get back into the uh, trans-Earth trajectory, is there not? There is, Walter, except that, uh, as I understand it, if you knew in advance that you were going to have a service propulsion problem, you could come back and uh, perhaps dock with the whole lamb and then use the descent stage to, oh. to get you out of lunar orbit. Yeah, it's a but, question of having some advance warning. But there is that point on, uh, on uh, uh, late Thursday, early Friday, when they send that, uh, late Thursday, when they send that uh, sent stage on, uh, on its way, orbiting around the moon on its own path, and uh, after that, it's too late to use that engine. 
Well, that's true. Yeah. The other thing I think about these things is that, as Nelson said, they really are very reliable. You can have a problem, I suppose, in the feed lines. You could have a problem with the valves, although there's always a backup set of those. But once you get the fuel and the oxidizer in there, they've almost got to burn. Yeah, right. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Forget everything you've ever known about size. Forget that an inch exists. We're taking you into a world where a speck of dust is a boulder. And a human hair, a rod. It's a sub-miniature world that we're working in now at Western Electric and Bell Telephone Laboratories. A world of complex electronic circuits. Some so tiny they can pass through the eye of a needle. At Western Electric, research engineers are finding new ways to make, test, and assemble these circuits. We'll be making them by the millions for new phones and equipment Bell Telephone companies will use to serve you. This is the kind of thing we do at Western Electric, finding new and better ways to make the things your phone calls are made of. Well, we've got another 17 minutes to wait if all has gone well on that far side of the moon before we know that it has gone well and that the flight of Apollo 10 is going as well around the moon as it has gone around the Earth and on the way to the moon. Unless something has gone wrong and they have not fired the engines and then we'll know that in about five minutes when they come around again. With me here in our CBS News Space Center is uh, Arthur C. Clarke, and for many years, long before we dreamed that man would be going to the moon, that I dreamed that man would be going to the moon in, uh, in our lifetime, he was dreaming of his great science fiction pieces. And has just uh, done the, the uh, screenplay for 2001, in which you visualize rather exotic moon travel in the future. Uh, Arthur, on the flight of Apollo 11, and now on this flight, we're going to learn a great deal from these fellows, of course, uh, about what goes on, but the Apollo 11 flight, uh, they are really preparing the way for a dress rehearsal to get the Apollo 11 successfully landed on the moon. Man's going to get out, walk around, pick up some of this space rock or moon rock. What, if you were the, that first, and you may be, that first debriefing of the Apollo 11 crew, what would you ask? What, what's the first question you'd want to know? Well, that's a... <laughs> well, I'd be glad to be home, I guess. <laughs> but you probably know that by now. Well, then. then you can take your, let's take your place right along with all their other television interviewers. I thought you'd have something special. Incidentally, there's a, there's a competition to start in a British Sunday newspaper. What should be the first words that they speak when they stand on the moon? That's a... What should mm -hmm. the very first sentence uttered by a human being on the moon be? Crime and ninny. I don't know. What would you say? Well, I only hope it isn't help. <laughs> oh, well, well that, that's a rather black bit of humor. I hope not, too, Arthur. Uh, what, what, what are the things that, uh, that uh, as, as a science fiction writer and a uh, scientist in this sense, in your own right, uh, the, the, what is the most important thing about well, their finding on the moon? Perhaps the most important thing we hope to get from the landing is confidence that we can operate and even do simple things like walking around, picking things up. It's not easy under lunar gravity, where you weigh, have only a sixth of your normal weight, where you're wearing a suit which restricts your movement, it's not easy to do a, a, apparently simple things like picking up a stone on the ground. They have to develop special tools. And really, the mission, they're only going to be outside the spacecraft for, I think, two hours altogether on this first mission. But the, the main thing is to prove it can be done and to build up confidence that there are no unexpected problems like sinking into the ground more than they expect. Um, there are many things which you, you, you have to learn that you can do these things. And once you've learned that, then you can be much more ambitious. Do you uh, uh, have any slightest thought that there is any life form on the moon? I think it's very unlikely. There's a much greater possibility that there may be the complex organic compounds which were the precursors of life. These may exist on the moon, perhaps a, a few feet down beneath the surface. But it's possible that there are life forms that exist there. We think that there are uh, life forms on Earth which might survive if they got to the moon. So if the moon's uh, 
climate was ever more benign than it is now, say, a few billion years ago, and if life ever got started there, or if it got splashed off from Earth onto the moon by meteorites that hit the Earth and sort of splashed bits of our oceans onto the moon, then it may still have survived a few feet underground where the temperature is not too extreme and where there may be moisture and chemicals necessary for life. It's unlikely, but it's possible. This, of course, would be a very low form of life, uh, well, not intelligent life. Uh, yes, uh, probably not intelligent life. But it need, it need not be a low in the biological sense. It might be pretty sophisticated to have adapted itself to that environment. What about the concern that some uh, scientists have shown around the world, and indeed our own people are showing, about the astronauts bringing back uh, some uh, a, a bug, a yeah. virus of some kind from, from the moon? Yes, the, the question of uh, back contamination. It's, it's very unlikely, but they are taking precautions against this. It's hard to know what precautions are adequate when one deals with a very improbable event, which if it does occur, may be very disastrous. You're multiplying an enormously large number by a very small number. How much money should one invest into this um, quarantine arrangement? And um, Now, the intention is, in case uh, some of our audience doesn't know, when they come back, they're going to be quarantined. The equipment is all built. They're going to be uh, put into quarantine as soon as they get out of the spacecraft and kept in the quarantine. That same uh, quarantine capsule is going to be transported with them right on back to Houston, and they'll be in it for uh, 18 days. 21 days. 21 days, yeah, yeah total. Uh, time before the landing is confidence that we can operate and even do a simple thing, walking around, picking things up. It's not easy under lunar gravity where you weigh have only a sixth of your normal weight, when you're wearing a suit which restricts your movement, it's not easy to do a, a, apparently simple things like picking up a stone on the ground. They have to develop special tools. And really, the mission, they're only going to be outside the spacecraft for, I think, two hours altogether on this first mission. But the, the main thing is to prove it can be done and to build up confidence that there are no unexpected problems like sinking into the ground more than they expect. Um, there are many things which you, you, you have to learn that you can do these things. And once you've learned that, then you can be much more ambitious. Do you uh, uh, have any slightest thought that there is any life form on the moon? I think it's very unlikely. There's a much greater possibility that there may be the complex organic compounds which were the precursors of life. These may exist on the moon, perhaps a, a few feet down beneath the surface. But it's possible there are life forms that exist there. We think that there are life forms on Earth which might survive if they got to the moon. So if the moon's uh, climate was ever more benign than it is now, say a few billion years ago, and if life ever got started there, or if it got splashed off from Earth onto the moon by meteorites that hit the Earth and sort of splashed bits of our oceans onto the moon, then it may still have survived a few feet underground where the temperature is not too extreme and where there may be moisture and chemicals necessary for life. It's unlikely, but it's possible. This, of course, would be a very low form of life, uh, well, not intelligent life. Uh, yes, uh, probably not intelligent life. But it need, it need not be a low in the biological sense. It might be pretty sophisticated to have adapted itself to that environment. What about the concern that some uh, scientists have shown around the world, and indeed our own people are showing, about the astronauts bringing back uh, some uh, a, a bug a yeah. virus of some kind from, from the moon. Yes, the, the question of uh, back contamination. It's, it's very unlikely, but they are taking precautions against this. It's hard to know what precautions are adequate when you're, one deals with a very improbable event, which if it does occur, may be very disastrous. You're multiplying an enormously large number by a very small number. How much money should one invest into this um, quarantine arrangement? And. Um, now, the intention is, in case uh, some of our audience doesn't know, when they come back, they're going to be quarantined. The equipment is all built. They're going to be uh, put into quarantine as soon as they get out of the spacecraft and kept in the quarantine. That same uh, quarantine capsule is going to be transported with them right on back to Houston, and they'll be in it for uh, 18 days. 21 days, 21 days, yes. yeah, total. Uh, time before they come out, uh, which is believed to be adequate enough for any life forms that they may have picked up on the moon to become apparent. Yes, great... again, it's uh, hard to judge because that's the incubation period of most of the infectious uh, epidemic diseases on Earth. But of course, if other diseases exist, how long would they take to incubate? Oh.
And, uh, and uh, since we don't, haven't built up any immunity to these things, I, uh, we, we might be wiped out by uh, a bug from the moon that we haven't even identified. It's very unlikely because anything there would be so specialized, it probably wouldn't enjoy us in the least. As we can even say it's the stuff of which science fiction is made. A lot of science fiction has been made of this. <laughs> It's just past 5.01 now, Arthur. It's coming up really on yes. 5.02. We haven't heard from the spacecraft, so we can assume that they have burned that service propulsion system engine. At least they got some burn out of it, and they have slowed up to a certain extent. They certainly haven't continued at 5,700 miles an hour. So uh, now we, it's a good sign, and we've got uh, another uh, uh, 10 minutes or so to, to wait uh, until we, we get some definite word that uh, everything has gone well and that uh, they are really coming around uh, with into the lunar orbit uh, that they had hoped for. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. We'll be talking to you a great deal Bye. more. You, you know you're right, standing right here, right by me, for, uh, for some more words of uh, interest and wisdom. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment.